Good morning. Everyone in this room, everyone in this room operates with a significant amount of faith. You might not think so, but it's true. I know that it took faith for you to show up in a room like this. You had to have faith that your car would get you here and back. Some of your faith might be a little stronger, some a little weaker on that topic. Uh, some, all of us have to have faith that other people who are driving will obey the rules of the road and the laws of the land. We still have to be alert, but we do trust that they're going to do that. You had to have faith that the facilities were going to be open and welcoming when you got here. You had to have faith that the food that you buy from the grocery store will be safe to eat. You have to have faith that your children, when they go to school, are going to learn something from teachers who've been trained to help them do that. We have faith that our heating and our air conditioning systems will operate without any interruption whatsoever. When it gets cold, the heat comes on. When it gets hot, the air conditioning comes on. Uh, we have to have faith that the money that we earn will be available to us when we swipe our cards or we write our checks. Without faith, every one of us would be paralyzed. We wouldn't be able to go anywhere. We wouldn't be able to accomplish anything. That is why the, the half-brother of Jesus named James, when he wrote his letter, he described faith without action as being a form of death. People cannot live without faith. Without faith, you would be unable to leave your home. Without faith, you would be unable to eat your food. Without faith, you would be unable to show up at work. Without faith, you wouldn't be able to do any of those things. We all live in a faith-based system. Without faith, we would not be able to function. So we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised that without faith, it is impossible to please God. We're in Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to begin in verse 1. It says, now faith, and by the way, this, I'm only going to read a few verses out of this chapter. This is the, like the hall of fame faith passage. A, a lot of people who earned reputations for acting in significant trust in God winds up with their names being listed here. But we're just going to read the first few verses of this chapter. It says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he, commend, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, a really important verse, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We already exercise a great amount of faith. We have faith in systems. We have faith in things. We have faith in people. So the question I have is, do you exercise faith in God? What does that look like? Faith actually animates us. It's fear that paralyzes us. I don't know if you've ever been so afraid that you couldn't move. You probably had a dream to that effect, right? If you've, if you've ever been terrified in a dream, you just felt 
paralyzed or, or so weak that you couldn't move. But that can happen in real life too. If we're afraid our car won't run, we won't get in it. If we're afraid that our doctors won't give us good medical advice, we won't schedule appointments with them. If we're afraid our employer won't pay us for our work, we won't show up for work. If we're afraid our bank won't keep our money safe, we won't put our money in the bank. If we are afraid that the person we're making promises to in a wedding won't keep their vows, we won't show up for the wedding. That's how people are. The question is not, do you have faith? You do. The question is, do you have faith in God? And maybe you're here and you're starting to think, I don't know. And this is a really good conversation for us to have. Our church actually has a mission, and the mission is to provide a safe place for people to find faith, friends, and their future. And so this morning, I want to spend our time talking about how do we create a safe place to find faith, because without faith, we have no options in pleasing God. Faith in God accepts that everything that we see came out of stuff that we don't see. That's what it said in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3, when we just read it. Faith in God believes that when we give an offering, that God can use that in ways, not only does he accept it, but he uses it in ways that makes a difference. That was found in verse 4. Faith in God believes that there's something beyond this life, that there's more than just a frame that kind of grows weary and old over time. There's something beyond this. That was in Verse 5, people who believe such things are activated in life. The minute you start believing those things, your actions start becoming different than if you didn't believe those things. This is not a children's story to make people feel good. This is a thrilling call to conquer in life. That's what faith does. Faith pleases God. Without it, we can't experience the incredible things that he has for us. When God sees you activated in life, pursuing the good gifts that he has prepared in advance for you, it pleases him. But it's not just faith that pleases God. Faith in God pleases God. Not just that you are able to make something happen or the friends you have are trustworthy or the job you have is secure, but that God actually is over all of these things and your faith is in him. Faith in God acts as though he is with you. Faith in God acts as though he is with you. Um, even though we can't see God, we can see evidence of his existence. I listen to story after story from person after person who describes what seemingly could be identified as a coincidence to somebody else, but the timing seemed to be so precise and the benefit so intense that they just assumed that it had to be a gift from God. It wasn't just something that accidentally or incidentally happened. It was part of God's provision. It's quite a remarkable thing when you start opening your eyes and seeing the evidence of what God is doing to bring things into your life. Faith in God acts as though he is with you, and faith in God acts as though he is for you. See, there's lots of people that think that God exists, but that he's really against them. That what he's come to do is to punish them, or to make an example out of them. And that is faith that God exists, but it's not faith that God is, is for you. God is with us and God is for us. So we've decided that what we want our church family to be and our facility to be is a safe place where we can learn about the goodness of God and then act accordingly. That's what faith is. I've learned about the goodness of God and now I act, I respond accordingly. So that means that we intentionally, when we are together, we intentionally focus on good news. I can see you're terribly excited about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I've watched, uh, in, in the course of my lifetime, just about every network's news option available. 
ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, Fox, uh, MSNBC, MOUSE. I mean, just, just the, they just, and this is what I've noticed that's consistent. It is not uncommon that in the course of a half hour that they will have a feel-good story of some good news, something that worked out well, something that someone made a difference in, and it maybe rescued a life or saved a life or invested significantly in someone else's life. But here's the challenge. Out of 30 minutes, we get less than one minute of good news. They do not call it the good news of ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN and etc. They just call it the news. And more accurately, they should call it the bad news. Because that's mostly what they show, right? You know it's true. Have you, have you ever been driving down the road and, and all of a sudden the traffic is almost stopped? I can be on the throughway and both lanes and, and I, I can't figure out what's wrong. Was there an accident? And sometimes there was an accident, but sometimes the accident wasn't even on our side of the highway. It was on the other side of the highway. And do you know what everybody does when they drive by an accident? Just in case there's broken bones and blood and, and fragments of humanity scattered all over the, the, the car, we don't want to miss that. That, that's something you do, you definitely, I mean, when was the last time you, you walked into the house and said, I am sorry, wait till you hear this, I saw two people holding hands today, it was so sweet, we don't do that. I saw two people fighting today, that's the story we tell. I saw two people cussing each other out today. I, we, we are attracted to, and we have a tendency to repeat bad news. Well, as it turns out, Jesus was a newscaster. Scripture declares that. In Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 23, it said, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news. That's the news Jesus proclaims. There wasn't any less bad news in Jesus' day. But he focuses on the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people and news about him spread all over Syria because there's not a lot of places you can go in our world and get good news. Jesus didn't share news, he shared good news. That's literally what the word gospel means. The word gospel means good news. So what good news did Jesus proclaim? He proclaimed that God is with you. His kingdom is here. <laughs> Act accordingly. If you really believe God was present and his kingdom was present, how would that change the way you act? You are invited. This is, what he, this is part of his good news. You are invited to be a citizen of God's kingdom. You can act accordingly. God is active right here, right now, in our lives and in our world. You can act accordingly. So how would you act if you believed that God is with you and God is for you? And the question I have is, is that the way you're already acting? Or would something change? Jesus acted as if all of those things were true. And 2,000 years later, we're still talking about him. I don't remember the names of hardly anyone who makes the news because as bad and cataclysmic as their actions may have been or the incidents in which they were involved, they will be forgotten within a short period of time. But the man who focused on preaching and teaching the good news of the kingdom of God is still discussed even when he's not believed in. That's the impact he had. Faith isn't about making God do something he doesn't want to do or wasn't planning on doing. Faith is believing that God wants to do good things already and we get to participate in them. 
If we do not share the good news that Jesus uh, declared, then we will wind up teaching things that Jesus did not teach. I don't know if you've ever heard a statement like this. I have, and I've, I've heard, I've heard uh, people who are preaching the Bible make statements like this. Jesus talks more about hell than he did about heaven. So I decided to see if that was true. It's not. Jesus talked not just many more times, but times more about the kingdom of heaven. He talked about the fact that God is with you. His kingdom is present among you. His spirit is available to you. He taught and preached the good news. Now, there's, there's, don't get me wrong. While there is good news in our world, it tends not to be focused on, and the things that aren't good news tend to get a lot of attention. So when there's a lack of resources, people pay attention to that. When there's a lack of honor or protection of the vulnerable, people pay attention to that. Where there's a lack of keeping promises, breaking commitments, people pay attention to that. Where there's a lack of respect or acceptance, people pay attention to that. Where there's a lack of trust, where there's a lack of peace, where there's a lack of kindness, where there's a lack of justice, where there's a lack of joy, where there's a lack of love, where there's a lack of patience, where there's a lack of self-control. These are all headlines every day, every single day. The kingdoms of this world only work for some people. But the kingdom of God can work in and through every single person, no exceptions. Jesus declares good news. God's kingdom can invade the darkness and the brokenness of this world. This is what he teaches us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom Come, your will be done on this, in this world as it is in heaven. That's what Jesus teaches. We treat heaven sometimes like an escape, like someday I'll get out of all of these problems and away from all of these burdens and I'll live my forever retirement life in heaven. I don't think heaven is going to be an eternal retirement village. And, and some of you might be going, oh no, then I don't know if I want to go. And, and what I want you to know is eventually you will get tired of sitting with your feet in a pool, drinking something that's got an umbrella stuck in it, and wearing cool looking shades. Eventually you will get tired of that. But the kind of purpose and glory and unbelievable capacity that God has intended for us in eternity, we will never grow weary of, we will never get tired of. It is going to be the adventure of an entire eternal lifetime. That's what God has for us. So, so heaven is not a way to escape. Heaven is a way to invade all the stuff that's broken and all the darkness that exists in our world. Escapism is not faith. It's just fear clothed in religious language. Faith acts like God is here and God is for us. And we keep asking him to do down here what he does all the time up there. How many would be okay with you if God started doing more heaven stuff right here on earth? Would that be all right with you? Yeah, I think it is. What you do up there, do down in my workplace, in my neighborhood, in my town, in my community, in my family, in my life, in my body. I want you to rule over all of these other kingdoms. I want your will to be done just like it's done up there, to be done down here. Our world is filled with other kingdoms. The question is, which kingdoms activate you? Sometimes kingdoms that act in unjust ways and they need fear to stay in power. We can be activated by that. That's not good news. We can play a part that God wants us to play rather than, than a part of what people keep doing in our world. So what makes the church a safe place? Um, I had a person come in one time and they were visiting and they came up afterwards to me. They, they asked if they could see me, and, and a person said, sure. And they, they walked right up, and, and they said, Pastor, isn't there any security in this church? And I said, well, yes, there is. And they said, but I walked right up, and I had complete access to you. I said, oh, they're not here to protect me. 
<laughs> you know, they protect our children and things like that. You, you can get to me fairly easily. What makes church a safe place? Is it bars on the windows or locks on the doors? Or what is it? What makes a church safe is our capacity to value and respect each and every person that enters our sacred space. If you're not valued and if you are not respected, then this place won't feel safe for you. So we take this mission quite seriously. It is our unshakable belief that every single person matters to God and he wants them to experience an amazing life. And we get to participate in that. I think that's good news. So which do you trust more, the kingdoms of the world or the kingdom of God? Which kingdom do you have more faith in? When you are in conflict with somebody, between you and another person, which kingdom is going to prevail? Are you going to seek forgiveness and reconciliation, or are you going to seek to gossip? See if you, there's a way for you to hurt them, or maybe avoid them. Every time we seek reconciliation and forgiveness, his kingdom is breaking into our world. When you have resources and you act with generosity and you let those resources go to make a difference in someone else's life, God's kingdom is breaking into our world. When a person decides to stop hiding their life controlling behaviors and start acknowledging the truth about them and seeking help and support in a loving community so that they can overcome them, that is God's kingdom breaking into our world. When a parent decides that their job is not the most important thing in their lives, that their spouse and their children are more important than that, that's a picture of God's kingdom breaking into our world. When a person speaks up for someone else who's being bullied or for the poor or for the powerless, that is an example of God's kingdom breaking into our world. When a person decides to be vulnerable and to love deeply, to act courageously, to give generously, the kingdom of God is breaking into to our world. God is with us and God is for us. How many could say amen to that? Faith isn't just feeling, because sometimes you don't feel so good. You know, um, one of the things I like about wedding vows is that there's no words of feeling in them. Not one. There's 78 words in wedding vows. And not one of them talks about a feeling. I was at a wedding yesterday. It was beautiful. It was a stunningly beautiful day, and it was an outdoor wedding. And it was just such a joyous occasion. And two people made promises to each other, and the promises didn't sound like this. As long as I feel like I feel today. You may never feel like this day again. <laughs> so, so now what? And you know what else you can't guarantee? You can't guarantee that no one is going to have a hard time or sickness will never invade your home or there will always be an abundance of financial resource or your friends will always be loyal and near you or any of those things. The promises they made weren't just based on their feelings and they weren't based on the outcome of how life could be. The promises they made were no matter what happens and no matter to who, I have decided that I want to do the rest of my life with you. That is a picture of faith. That's faith. It's not just a feeling. It's not just a doctrinal position. Well, pastor, I believe that the Bible says this, and then they'll describe that. That's my faith. Well, faith is based on doctrinal positions, but our faith is the simple trust that God is with us and God is for us. We are not here to promote the kingdoms of this world. We are here to proclaim that the kingdom of God is within our reach. He is with you and he is for you. And faith isn't just a single step. It begins with a single step, but it's a journey that goes on for the rest of your life. How far can you go with God in our world? What difference would that make in your life, in your family, in your business, in your neighborhood, in your community? I'm gonna ask the worship team to come out. 
We want people to come to our church. Not so that we can brag that we have more people than someone else's church, or even brag that we have more people than we used to have in our church. If you've been around here very long, you know we don't talk about that hardly at all. We want to invite every person in our community to experience the grace of God for themselves. But that's not the only reason. Our goal is also to help encourage and equip every person who attends so that they, wherever they go, they are expanding the kingdom of God, that God's will is being invited to every place that they go. Our goal is to try to model as best we can kingdom behavior, not just so that this is a safe little island for us to come to, but that we can take those examples and lift them out wherever we go. We work really hard on language. One of the things you, you know, I try really hard to do is not use insider language so that you have to be raised in the church to know what I'm talking about. Why do we do that? Because I want everyone to know the goodness of God. But I also want us to have language that when we're talking to our friends and our family and our neighbors, that they don't have to have been raised in the church to understand what you're saying. When our Heavenly Father sees us acting like the good news is real, He smiles. When a person confesses their sin because they trust that grace is greater than their guilt, makes God incredibly happy. When a person asks him for something that is not possible according to the standards of human effort, a smile comes across his face. When a person uses their abilities and their talents and their experience to serve someone else, God smiles. And someone steps into the waters of baptism. We saw it last week. What's happening? They're taking a step of faith. This is the life I'm going to live now. And when we take steps of faith, it pleases God. Jesus laid down his life so that we could experience real life. The cross doesn't just guarantee forgiveness. It does that, but that's not all that it does. It launches us into a new kingdom where everything is possible. This house is a safe place to find faith in God. Your house could be a safe place to find faith in God. You can be a safe person for people to have faith conversations with. It's time to start sharing good news. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you. All the news that you have for us is good. You love us with an unending love. Your power has no boundaries. And your mercy is new every single morning. Would you help us act accordingly? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.